Anyway, so this went on for some time and we made our way to the very south of Sri Lanka and then we went along Hambantota, all those places. And then we got to the area where there's a huge national park, a big national park, Yala National Park. It's the biggest national park in the country and it goes right to the coast. So we decided, hmm, that's going to be a little bit more difficult to walk along here because there are no villages or towns or anything. Anyway, we set off and almost immediately we realized that we had a problem because <coughs> um, there were so many small rivers running from the forest into the sea. So some of them were quite deep. So we had a choice either to swim across them or sometimes we could walk across them. But more often we thought it best to walk up the bank of the river where, when it got smaller, cross over and then come back down again. So we, we, we did this. Anyway, on one particular occasion we came across some fishermen on the beach. We talked to them and we continued on and after we'd passed them some time we came to a wide and appeared to be quite shallow river. So we hitched up our robes and we started to cross the river and the, um, the, sh the, the, the fishermen started shouting and trying to attract our attention and we couldn't understand what the problem was. Anyway, we kept on walking and they got even more animated. And um, one of the men was shouting out, Kimbula, Kimbula, Kimbula. And I knew enough Singhala at that time to know what that meant. It meant crocodiles. <laughs> so we got ourselves out of that water really very, very quickly. And as a consequence of this, we realized we are not going to be able to walk all the way along because we would have had to cross many such rivers and many of them had crocodiles in them. So reluctantly we decided to abandon our plan to walk around Sri Lanka and um, then bit by bit we returned to uh, Kandy. Um, I, I visited lots of other places, um, particularly the Aranyas where forest monks lived. I became familiar with their lives and their practices. Sometimes I stayed with them for weeks. Um, and this inspired me to continue doing my meditation. And um, as I mentioned earlier, I started by uh, doing a meditation taught to me by a Burmese um, teacher. And then, although I didn't mention it before, when I was in India, before I'd become a monk, I had done a course with, uh, with Goenka, one of the first courses that Goenka had done uh, in India. And so his 10-day uh, uh, meditation course inspired me so much that I ceased doing the Burmese meditation I had been doing and started doing his meditation. And I found that um, that he was a very inspiring teacher. He was quite young in those days. Um, and it was very clearly defined what needs to be done. Um, uh, the results that you should get were very clearly defined. And in that sense, it was a very well presented um, um, practice. And so I, I continued to do that. But then when I met um, Godwin Samaratna, he had a very different approach to meditation. A very, what I would call a very experiential and a very unstructured technique. So it seemed to me uh, that most uh, meditation uh, practices are very structured. You, you do this on day one, you do this, and then you sit in this way, and you've got to do that way, and then you put your hands in this way, and it's very, very structured. And for a beginner, that can be very helpful. But later on, I, I think, first of all, everybody who starts meditating is different. And the reality is that different people respond better to different approaches. 
And so I think that um, uh, people like Achan Chah, whose approach was very unstructured also, I think probably um, after preliminary getting into the, the, the um, spirit of meditation, then it's time to perhaps do a technique that is less structured. And um, this is what uh, Godwin taught. And so I started basically learning, uh, listening to his ideas and adopting his practices. And basically his practice was just simple mindfulness. You don't necessarily have to sit for a particular time, nor in a particular uh, posture. Um, and as much as possible, you try to be mindful, not just when you're sitting in meditation, but when you're doing other things as well. So for example, he always used to be very quiet when he ate. So he would, basically, he was e eating mindfully, he was observing mindful eating. And um, watching him and being with him over a period of time, I came to feel that he was somebody whose meditation had transformed them a great deal in a most admirable way. And so I started basically doing his meditation, and that consisted of mindful breathing, hmm? mindfully going about your daily life, um, seeing your inner life and gently modifying those things that make you unhappy and enhancing and encouraging those states of mind that make you, make you happy. And the other thing he emphasized a great deal was loving-kindness meditation. And uh, his way of teaching it was particularly attractive because it was very clear, even on first meeting him, that he was a very, very gentle, kindly person. As so, so that made what he was saying much more um, authentic, as it were. So I started doing his meditation, and in fact I've sort of basically continued that ever since. So this was the other thing that I did. On one hand, in Sri Lanka, I set out to explore the country and get to know its culture and its history and what have you, which I found very rewarding. And on the, the other hand, I started to spend a great deal of time uh, um, or giving a great deal of emphasis on, on meditation. Getting to know meditation better, going deeper into it, and spending more time meditating. These were the two things I took with me when I eventually left Sri Lanka after about 20 years.